Well, I'm extremely excited and also nervous because of a couple of things. Firstly, we're going to broadly talk about something which definitely changed the course of Indian cricket history, but also, well, could well be about world cricket as well. And uh, most importantly, talking with someone that I've uh, idolized and still do, uh, because he still remains such an inspiration, not just during his playing days, but even after that. Uh, well, obviously, he needs no more introduction. We're talking about Michael Holding. Uh, thank you so very much, Mikey, for your time. Uh, to start off with, obviously, I mean, uh, I grew up listening about you, watching you, and obviously from my dad to a great extent, he's yeah. huge, huge cricket fan, and he's he would he would obviously mention Death Whisperer. So where did you get that moniker from, and who gave it, and and do you remember anything about it? Well, I I wasn't aware of it initially. It's a journalist who made me aware of it because they, it's Dicky Bird who gave me the name. And I wasn't aware of it until I retired. And I was actually in the press box doing, doing commentary. And a journalist came up to me and said, hi, whispering death. A, gen a gentleman I've known for quite some time. So I spun around and said, what? <laughs> what? What are you talking about? And he said, didn't you know that's your nickname? I said, no, where's that from? And he told me it was Dickie Bird. So eventually I went to Dickie and asked him about it. And Dickie said, yes, you had given me that name. I asked Dickie, you know, what is this whispering death thing about Dicky? And he said, well, Mikey, when you were running in, I couldn't hear you when you were coming. I had to keep on looking behind me to see if you were actually running in. I said, yeah, I can understand that, but I never killed anybody, Dicky. What is this death thing about? And he said, no, but you could have. <laughs> yeah, should have, should ask the batters back then uh, who, were, who were facing you, I guess. They would have a few things to say about that. Uh, but but absolutely, I mean, I, I still remember you running in and, and it, it was an absolute pleasure. I mean, obviously, athlete that you were. Uh, but just, just talking about the 83, what's the first reaction when I say 83 World Cup? Pain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the West Indies had won 1975 and 79. I wasn't a part of the 75 team, but I was a part of the 1979 team. And of course, everybody that was a part of the 75 team and, and others, everyone would have been thinking, yes, three World Cups. The West Indies are going to be champions again. Three World Cups in a row, fantastic feat, great achievement, that sort of a thing. And it just fell apart at the finals, you know. <laughs> It was very disappointing. And most West Indians would you know, kind of move on from that and forget it quickly. Fair enough. Not as Indians. I mean, it changed almost no, everything. Definitely yeah. Not. yeah. Uh, let's, let's just talk about that era, the 70s, the early 80s, uh, when West Indies dominated cricket. I mean, whether it was Test Match, ODI, just name it. It was just domination, the real sense of the word. What was it, obviously, apart from the world-class players that were there, but what was it that made that team tick and come together as that unit? You use the, the right word there, Nadi. The team. It was a proper team. We were all together. The West Indies have produced a lot of great cricketers in the past and had a lot of great cricketers in the CM11 at various times. But they weren't as together as we were in the late 70s, early 80s. And I think the reason because is because most of that team, the majority of that team, were a part of World Series cricket, were a part of PACA. We were pretty much ostracized from world cricket. We were not playing, representing the West Indies. We were just representing ourselves, although a lot of West Indians supported what we were doing, but we were not officially representing the West Indies. And we had nothing else deep. We had ourselves. So we bonded together very well in that team. We supported each other. We were together, irrespective of which island we were from. The captain, Clive Lloyd, helped a great deal in that degree because he wasn't interested in island politics and who was from where. He was interested in getting good cricketers and producing a winning team. Another factor that helped with that was the mere fact that we were with World Series cricket and we had to be a lot more professional with our approach to the game, the training that we did. We had a guy called Dennis Witt that was assigned to the team that got us extremely fit, motivated us, and all that came together to produce the team that we had. 
Right. I mean, at that point, I'm obviously a battery of fast bowlers, just to name a few yourself, Andy Roberts, Joel Garner, Malcolm Marshall. I mean, there was a battery of fast bowlers, but what what was the role? Did you have different roles assigned? Because more often than not, four of you guys would play, would have different roles or what was it like? I wouldn't say we were assigned the different roles. We were all different. All four of us were different. The original four, when you have Colin Croft, Joel Garner, and Robert Somersell, we were all different. We had different actions, of course, played roles differently, yes, but I wouldn't say that it was assigned. We were played different roles because of what we did. And then myself were the fast bowlers, out and out fast bowlers. Croft and Ghana, not out and out fast bowlers, they were quick enough, but those guys could bowl longer spells. Joel Ghana could bowl an entire session. Colin Croft could bowl an entire session and come back after the session and then come back and bowl again in the next session because that was the type of bowler that, that they were. And so, Although we weren't assigned roles, we had different roles depending on, of course, what the captain wanted, but also because of our makeup. There was no way I was going to bowl an entire session because I was running in trying to bowl as fast as I could. Six, seven hours at the most. And so that is how the team was built as far as the fast bowling is concerned. Uh, was there any, um, when I say competition in the right or, or in a positive sense, was there any competition amongst yourselves as in to, you know, uh, get the better of others or there was a banter and uh, what was it like? Well, we, we weren't competing against each other in the sense that we wanted one bowler to get more than another bowler, that sort of a thing. Mm. We were competing against ourselves because of natural pride. Every time you have the ball in your hand, you want to take wickets. And if you don't take wickets, you're a feeler, a little bit down. But at the same time, you're not going to come off the, your bowling attack or bo your bowling spell and think to yourself, well, I didn't get a lot of wickets. Let's hope the next man doesn't get any either so that I can come back and get wickets later on. The, the, I don't think that was ever in any of, any of us's minds. But at the same time, we were just there trying to get 20 wickets. It was important that we got those 20 wickets as cheaply as we possibly could so that we could win the test match. And we kind of bounced things off each other as well. Did. We knew each other's game. We could stand up at fine leg or even at mid off wherever and look at one of the other bowlers bowling and think to ourselves, oh, he's slightly off at today. You know, he's not doing this quite the way that we... And we'd have a little bit of a chat in between overs with each other. Joel Garner, for instance, might come up to one of us and say, I'm not getting the ball to leave the right hander. For whatever reason, I'm, I'm shining this ball, at, but I'm not getting it to leave the right hander. And we'd suggest to, 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 to Joel to change the way he's holding the ball, or he might come up to Andy. It, it was all of us working together, trying to get wickets and trying to do the best for the team. True. I mean, I, I read it somewhere where you've mentioned the contribution of uh, Andy Roberts in your oh, career. Yes. You've learned so much. Talk about that part, please, about Andy Roberts and his contribution. Well, early in my career, I, I roomed a lot with Andy Roberts. When I went on my first tour, I roomed with, with Lawrence Rowe. My second tour, I roomed with, with second tour, I roomed with Bib Farwell and, and Lawrence Rowe as well. But after that, I roomed a lot with Andy. And I got to, to know that Andy knew so much about the game. He was a quiet man. Hard ever saw Andy talking too much. But when you got to know him, because I knew him from, from early days, the two of us started our careers with our respective islands at just about the same time. We were 12 men for our respective islands, sat down on that bench at Sabina Park, and that's where the friendship grew. And I got to realize that Andy, not a big talker, but knew a lot about the game, knew how to assess batsmen, knew exactly what he wanted to do. And of course, he had the skills to do whatever he wanted to do. And then you could learn from him. So I spent a lot of time with him. I grew up with him throughout my cricketing career and learned a great deal from him. Hmm. Well, talking about working together, I mean, if you look at nowadays, you have your support staff members are more than actually players in dressing room nowadays. You have an analyst for batting, for bowling, uh, 18, 20 people helping uh, the players out. What was the thing back then? How would you plan? Obviously, as you mentioned, you would do that yourself and stuff like that. But if you can give us a sense of what was the planning was like back then? How would you help each other out? Uh, you touched upon it as well uh, while ago. Yeah, well, in the team meetings, everybody was given the, an opportunity to say something, to talk about whatever they thought that they needed to discuss. 
And the fast bowlers in particular, as I said, even on the field, we would talk amongst each other. But what we did then was all about from memory. Oh, we remember playing against this particular fellow. And this is what he did. This is where his weakness was. This is what he likes to do. All from memory. We didn't have these videotapes to go back and look at and discuss and pinpoint and people showing you graphs of where he scored most of his runs. We didn't have anything like that. But we had our memories and we had our brains to think. I think a lot of the guys these days don't think enough. They depend on outside staff to be telling them everything. And I have no problem with having a lot of outside staff, you know, because the game has changed, the world has changed, there's so much cricket being played now. Get as much help as you can. But at the same time, the players need to recognize that they are in charge of their game. They are the ones that need to think about their game a lot more and not wait on people to be telling them what they need to do or telling them exactly how they need to go about their jobs. That is not the way it should work. Have them as a last resort. Have them, if you have a specific problem, you may be able to go to them and say, listen, what did you notice about this? But you must be the first person. You must be the first stop as far as your game is concerned and progressing your game. And that is how we built that West Indies team. We could go to Viv Richards, the great Viv Richards as bowlers, and we could talk to Viv about certain things that were happening. Viv could come to us bowlers. Clive Lloyd, the man in charge, he would leave a lot of the bowling stuff to us bowlers. Of course, he was in charge on the field and saying, listen, you're going to bowl this end, that end. You're going to bowl this many overs and that sort of a thing. But at the same time, deep, whenever Clive Lloyd was in charge, he didn't make it that I am in charge, that's the only way it's going to go. There was always a chance of you saying, Skipper, what about this? And he would listen to what you have to say. And if he thinks it makes sense, or he thinks it's something that, okay, we'll try because in a test match, you, cannot, you can try something one over and two. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't lose you the test match, which might be different in a one-day game. And in test match cricket, because of the length of the, of the time in which you play, he will be willing to you know, allow a little bit of slack here or there and allow somebody to go off on a tangent because he, this person thinks that is this, he, this is what he wants to do. And that is how Clive Lloyd was so flexible. And that is why he got the respect from his team that he got. We all respected him. We all would do whatever he wanted us to do. But he was at the same time, although the leader, he wasn't draconian about his leadership. He was always easygoing and allowing people to, to do, do a little bit of their own stuff. Absolute legend. Right. Uh, going towards now the 83 World Cup. Obviously, you were unbeaten in World Cup till the 83. So what was the mindset like getting into the World Cup? Well, one day games deep, you, you never can be sure that you're going to win one day games. You know? One day games can be a little bit dice because a couple of mistakes, even one mistake can cost you the game. It's not, as I said, like a test match when you have a chance to rebound. You drop a, a catch in a one day game, it might lose you the entire one day game. That particular batsman may go on and just win the game for, for the opposition. So we were confident, yes, but we weren't sure that, hey, we're just going to win and win this World Cup. It's just going to be three in a row. Every game that we approached, we approached it with caution. We were confident, but we approached it with caution because we knew one-day cricket was not a certainty. It's not always the best team that wins a one-day game. It's whoever plays best on that day. So we went into the competition confident and, yes, saying, yes, we should win, but we were cautious about every game. Mm. Well, the first game obviously was against India, which uh, India won. And that was, I guess, the first time West Indies lost a game in World Cup. Uh, any memories for that game? I, I mean, something that I've read was played over two days. And I guess India got a little lucky with the weather. I mean, it was uh, India batted first, sunny conditions. And the second day when West Indies came out to bat, it was quite bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think the West Indies were fortunate that it was the first game. Because in the first game, those days, the structure of the World Cup, you could always rebound from losing a game. And the first game you lose that game and the conditions under which you lose that game is easy to, for you to say, okay, the conditions didn't quite suit us. Not that we were expecting to lose. We mm -hmm. thought we would still win because those days, India were not a very strong team as far as one day cricket was concerned. Their entire tactic, the way they approached the one day game, wasn't the way they would do it. No, obviously different. But we thought 
those days that we could beat India on almost any day. And we lost. And that kind of woke, up, woke us up a bit. And we thought to ourselves, okay, we lost the game. Things weren't perfect for us, but at the same time, we slipped. And from then, we approached each game even more cautious, but even more adamant that we were going to win and more planning going into each game. Right now, the finals, obviously, at that point in time, it was two group games and then you qualify semi-final and final. So before the final was 1-1, West Indies won, India won, and you go into the finals. Uh, was it, how, how was the approach then, like you said, was more planning going into the game, uh, finals that I'm talking about now against India? And, and what was it like before the finals? Not any more planning than, than any other game in or than any other game that we played against India. There was no more planning. We always planned well before each game. We'd always assess the opposition and think about how we wanted to bowl to them and what sort of field placing we wanted to have for them. Not that we had very dynamic field placing those days because you know anyone who looks back at one day cricket in those days did. At the beginning of the one day game, people not knowing it was a one day game, would think it was a test match because the West Indies went in with their customary number of slips and that sort of thing because we were looking to get wickets. We were looking to get people out because we had a fantastic bowling attack. But what happened in that final is that when we dismissed India that cheaply because 180 yard runs in a 60 over yeah. game, that yeah. is nothing, absolutely nothing. I think we got a little bit too complacent. I think we thought to ourselves, yes, you know, we were confident coming into this World Cup. We thought we would win, although it has been not as smooth and as easy as it should have been. We are going to win this game. And I think the batsmen went out. They are a little bit overconfident, a little bit too complacent. And when we started to fall, everybody was thinking, oh, the next man will get those runs. And then it got to the point where it was too late. Yeah. India played well and they stuck to their guns. But I think we were a little bit too complacent. Mm. So a couple of uh, uh, urban legends, my, you might want to call it. One was obviously during the break, obviously 183, as you mentioned, wasn't a lot. But I've heard one of you, could be you yourself, somebody said, you know, let's not take it easy. 183 is not a lot of runs, but, you know, you still got to be cautious. Did, did that chat happen at all? I mean, did, I mean... Not really. Not really. I can't remember that chat in the dressing room. Yeah. Um, it's not that I don't remember anybody in the dressing room thinking, oh, it's all over either. Nothing was said in that regard. Yeah. Everybody approached 183 runs and thinking, yes, we have got to get them. But I don't think anybody was thinking it's going to be a struggle. I think yeah. they were all thinking 183 runs is not a lot of runs. We just go there and bat and we'll get the runs. I don't think anybody said, oh, it's going to be a struggle or we have to be careful or anybody said, oh, it's easy. We don't even have to watch. Nothing like that. Fair enough. The other thing I, I, I heard was uh, it was Balwinder Sandhu, number 11, and Malcolm Marshall bowled a bouncer and he was reprimanded by Dickie Bird uh, saying, how, how can you bowl a bouncer to a number 11? And, and well, I mean, something that you, you remember happening or did you, are you aware of that? No, to be honest, I, I, I don't remember that, but it, it possibly could have happened because, you know, Dickie Bird was that type of an umpire. You know, <laughs> Sandu, everybody would know that he's not the best of batsmen. True. And with India not getting a lot of runs, Dickie would have perhaps thought to himself, you know, what, what's the point? You know, they haven't even got the 200. What's the point of bowling a bounce at somebody who can't really bat? And I think that was the mindset in most people that yeah. this is not a lot of runs. Why bother to be Bowling a bouncer, this is not a lot of runs. If it was 208 and you say, you know, you want to save every run, you want to blast them out to the crease, fine. I think that was the mindset of everybody. I, I don't think too many people thought 108 was going to be a lot. Right. And to be fair, I've, I've also heard that Martin Marshall did apologize as well. Uh, I mean, to be fair to the story. Uh, uh, I guess as soon as he bowled a bounce, he apologized. So, fair enough. Um, Peter, I'm, I'm very sorry. I, my dog is barking. Are you hearing that? 
Yeah, yeah, but that's nice. That's good. Good to hear. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Not fond of dogs anyway. So that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, now, obviously, now you uh, West Indies batting now. Uh, was it any time that you felt as a team or you as an individual as well that it's slipping away? We got to be careful or something like that. I don't think we thought it was slipping away until we got down into a very low order. You know, when Bib Richards was still batting, we thought, okay, you know, Bib is still there. You know, after he got out, now things started to get a little bit dicey. And when you think he going down into Dujan and mm-hmm. Joel Ghana, and even when I got to the crease deep, I thought yeah. to myself, we can't lose this. How, how are we going to lose? Why? This, we should not lose this. It didn't hit home to me, actually, until I got out. And I thought, hey, there's nobody else to come. <laughs> It's <laughs> I mean, you and Joel Ghana had a had a 14-run partnership. I think you, you guys played about six, seven overs, actually. Still another eight overs to go when, obviously, unfortunately, you were the last person to get out. Yeah, well, that, that's what I'm saying. You know, we, at the crease, we're still thinking, we're going to win this game. You know, yeah. we're not going to lose this game. It, that was just the mindset. And as yeah. I said, when I got out, it was a total shock. Because I am there thinking, I am the last man. There's nobody left. I just got out. It's over. Oh, jeez. So, so you're walking back or you're back in the dressing room. I mean, just talk me through that. I mean, what was it like in that dressing room? Was, was anyone well, talking at all? Before I even got back to the dressing room, the disaster struck. Because I was in so much shock. Everybody's running off the field. I, I was in so much shock. I didn't run. I just turned around, I was walking towards the pavilion and with so many people storming onto the field, somebody trod on my right leg and I tore ligaments in my right ankle. My right ankle. So I couldn't even continue walking. It's Andy Roberts who had to run out onto the field because Andy saw what was happening. He ran out onto the field, grabbed me up and took me into the dressing room. So before I even got to the dressing room for us to think about what has happened or the disaster, the disaster as far as me personally was concerned had already taken place out on the field. When we got back to the dressing room now, the dressing room was like a ghost town. Everybody was sitting there again, perhaps in shock, wondering what had taken place. Why haven't we won? And then, of course, the blame game started. People started to blame people. You know, first of all, batsmen started to say, oh, they shouldn't have made 180 yet because you know how it is. And bowlers are saying 180. That, that shouldn't be anything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess uh, dressing rooms never change, I believe. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, you know it is. Yeah. yeah. Having said that, I mean, uh, I, I saw a few of the pictures. Dennis Lilly was there in that dressing room, wasn't he, for the finals in that West balcony? Yeah. I mean, I, I saw a picture of Dennis Lilly sitting there and, and I, I was like, why was he there? And do you I, do you remember any anything about that? No, I don't remember that at all. Uh, I don't remember. The, I don't remember the, any. I remember some West Indians, non cricketers, being in the dressing room. You know, okay. a couple of board members were in the dressing room. I think a yeah. couple of selectors might have been there, but I can't remember anybody not connected to the West Indies team being in it. Maybe because he was on the balcony, I didn't see him because I I was sitting down inside, not moving because of my ankle. And of course, I Dennis Wade came in and strapped mm-hmm. ice on my ankles, you know, for the injury and that sort of thing. So I was just sitting there. Fair enough, fair enough. The, the other thing I, I heard, again, you, you, you just got to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Half time, apparently, because 183 wasn't a lot and it was West Indies. So I believe the champagne bottles were kept in, in the West Indian dressing room and it was only one bottle in the dressing Not room. Not two. I don't know about that one either. <laughs> they, they, wouldn't have, they wouldn't have brought champagne into the dressing room before the game ended. Maybe they, they stored it, you know, somewhere close to the dressing room. Maybe. And they were getting ready to bring it in because they thought more, more than likely West yeah. Indies would win. I, I, I have no doubt that everybody thought we would win. But there was no champagne inside the dressing room.
talking about the 83 finals, obviously, India winning, it was huge. I mean, especially for my generation. I mean, a lot of us started playing cricket because of that. But obviously, leaving the Indian side aside, what do what you think was the effect of that 83 Indian victory on world cricket, if there was any, you reckon? Well, you can't leave the Indian side out of it, you know, because 1983 with India winning the World Cup changed the entire outlook of the BCCI and cricket in India. Before that, India didn't concentrate a great deal on one-day cricket. It was all about test match cricket and all about developing test cricketers. And that is why I said from the very beginning that India's approach to one-day cricket wasn't quite this way it should have been as far as a one-day game is concerned. That's why they weren't as successful at the game as they were in test match cricket. Because then India had a lot of great players, but it was the approach, the way they played the one-day game. If you remember Sunil Gabasa went out there in a particular game, people said he was upset. That, that's why he did it and batted like 50 over for 50 yard run, that sort of thing. When <laughs> India won that 83 World Cup, everything changed in, in India. We went to India after that. We went to India right after that and won a test series easily, won all the one-day games. But the approach and the thought processes that took place in India after that 83 World Cup just changed everything. It was a similar situation with the 2020 World Cup in South Africa. If you remember, India did not even send their best team to that World Cup because they weren't really interested. They were not interested in 2020 cricket. They won it, and what happened after that? The entire outlook and the entire thought processes of BCCI and cricketers in India changed again. And mm. different 2020 tournaments sprang up. Mm. One that wasn't supported by the BCCI, and then one supported by the BCCI, and everything changed. And that's because when people have success, they want more of that success, irrespective of the form of the game. And so, that's what happened with the India team in the three World Cup. Mm. Right, because, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was huge. I mean, it obviously, the next World Cup happened in India, the Reliance World Cup and everything else happened, so on and so forth. Uh, but just taking it forward, obviously, now commentary and now you've moved on and doing other stuff as well. Something that, again, is very, very inspirational is obviously the book. Uh, it's absolutely phenomenal. And, and also, uh, you know, you mentioned about way back in the 70s, you all came together. How huge was the Bob Marley influence on, on that generation? Oh, the, the, what influence? Sorry, I didn't get that. The Bob Marley influence. Oh, Bob, was... Bob Marley? Yeah. <laughs> well, the, I yeah. saw something and read something that yeah. one of our cricketers reported that Bob Marley used to come to the dressing room. Hmm. I never saw Bob Marley in the dressing room. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I know that Bib Richards and yeah. one of the whalers yeah. were pretty good friends. Yeah. Bob Marley was more of a football fan and a footballer than a cricket person. Right. Obviously, he knew cricket. He knew yeah. the cricketers. He knew about the West Indies team. Yeah. But I never saw Bob Marley come to a West Indies dressing room. Bonnie right. Wheeler, as I said, he and Bib Richard were pretty close, you know, good friends. Jamaica, we would come to Jamaica and he would go and visit Bonnie Wheeler, that sort of a thing. But I don't know about Bob Marley coming in the dressing room. But, you know, great West Indian, great Jamaican. We follow his music. Everybody listen to his mm -hmm. music. But going beyond that, I don't know about. Fantastic. Uh, right. Uh, again, just... Just to uh, go back to that 83, and now we're gonna do is um, I'm gonna uh, I'm I'm gonna name the play up in the playing eleven. I'm gonna uh, take the names of all the eleven, and what is the first thought that comes to your mind when I take those names, right? So could be one word, could be a sentence, whatever. Uh, you got on okay, your mind. Mercy. That's a bit rough. All right, so yeah, so eleven of them, starting with obviously Sunil Gavaskar. Fantastic player. Great player, you know, great friend, you know, as well. It's glad to say, although we had our run ins when we were playing <laughs> against each other. Great friend, fantastic. Okay, Chris Krishnamacharya Srikant. First thing that comes to mind when you call his name, 
is whirlwind. <laughs> <laughs> Both on and off. <laughs> Tree can't, he used to play some shots that you think to yourself, what was that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Right, Mohinder Ramanath. Another great guy. Great guy. We became good friends when he toured West Indies, when West Indies toured India. Even, even now, you know, when I think of him, all I do is smile. Good guy. Yeah. Um, then Yashpal Sharma. To be honest, I'm going to tell you that I don't remember a lot about Yashpal Sharma. Obviously, I played against him and he was a good player, but he's not someone that immediately strikes me when you call his name. Right. Uh, Sandeep Patel. Oh, mercy. Technically sound, you know, looked so easy, quiet guy, just went about his job. Nice. Uh, Kapil, uh, Kapil Lev. Well, you know, they always say that Imran Khan, Imran Khan is talking about a lion and Kapil, take my, Kapil Dev might be a tiger, but Kapil Dev was a sort of cricketer that you could never take for granted. At any time, at any point, he could change the game with batter ball. Mm, true. Uh, Kirti Azad. Good guy. I remember Kirti very well. Again, a guy that was very friendly. You have some guys that when you play against them, you want to beat them and you want to do well against them. But at the same time, you want to make friends with them because they are nice guys and they are friendly guys. I remember going to India many times after that, many years after that. And going to Kirti's hometown, which was way out from any of the major cities. Yes. And he pretty much looked after us. He said, you're in my hometown. I'm going to make sure that you are ah. taken care of. Good guy. Yep. Uh, Roger Binney. Roger Binney. What an action. And I'll never forget how his, his back foot pointed almost in the wrong direction when he was bowling. That ankle must have been made out of rubber. <laughs> but... <laughs> But as someone with good control, not quick, but he knew what he was doing with the ball and he had good control. And more times than not, he had a smile on his face. That, that was one of the things that I admired about that particular Indian team. Mm. I didn't see anybody upset and getting vexed and even saying anything that they shouldn't be saying on a cricket field and always looking to enjoy themselves and looking to enjoy being on, being on the field. Yeah, and that, that's something that Sunny Sir keeps telling. I mean, every time I ask about that generation, he said, nobody spoke a word. I mean, it was no, a stale, no. that's it. And you just carry on. So, I mean, that's something that was, I mean, ugh, unbelievable. I mean, you look at so much which has been said nowadays and actions and stuff like that. Well, I guess we can do with less of that. Anyways, uh, mother yeah, love. Yeah. The world has changed. Yeah, true. Right. Uh, Madan Lal. Madi, as we used to call him. Madan. Again, Madan Lal, excellent control. Did quite a bit with the ball in, in either direction. Hmm. No, but at the same time, you think about Madi. Hmm. Perhaps all of them, you know, as a, as a brother, you know, <laughs> you're not thinking about him as an adversary. There are so many guys in that team that you think about him that way. Mm, lovely. Well, Sayed Kirmani. Kiri, again, I had an excellent relationship with Kiri. And then it, break, it broke down in, 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 in Madras when we played a test match down there in 83. I won't go into the details, but it broke down because we had a misunderstanding in Madras. But Kiri, again, you know, great guy. We used to have good fun with him. He used to come into our dressing room, sit down, laugh, have a little bit of a soft drink. And you know, there were so many guys like that in that Indian team. We, you know, we just had a great relationship with that team. Yeah. Uh, Balvinder Singh Sandhu. Sandhu, the turban man. <laughs> <laughs> Still he, can't he, forget that delivery that got rid of Gordon Greenwich. Gordon <laughs> Greenwich. He, oh, I don't think God knew exactly what, what hit him because <laughs> I think he was looking almost to leave the ball alone and then thought, oh, no, this is, this is not one to leave. <laughs> but, you know, he looked a little bit innocuous with his hmm. bowling, hmm. but under the English conditions, 
because mm. he had the, the control and because the English conditions helped that sort of bowling, mm. he was always going to be dangerous. Mm. Yeah. Well, those were the 11s. But when you look at that team and that those 11 guys, do you see a lot of those guys who kind of suited those conditions? Sandhu, Madan Lal, yeah. Rajabini. Mm. Yeah, but even Mohinda Amanath with his little doubly things under those conditions, he, he was difficult to get away. I think mm. the bowling attack that India had, the conditions that were played under in that final suited them very well. And mm. when you look at the lineup, especially the bowling lineup deep, nobody will look mm. at that bowling lineup just thinking today of the, the names and think, oh, yeah. they're going to bowl out Western is for less than 180. Mm. Nobody would think that. Yeah. But the conditions under which that game was played, and the discipline that those guys showed right. enabled them to get the job done. Right. Uh, again, uh, so after the 83, you uh, West Indies come over to India. Was there any like revenge or anything on your mind? Ki, you know, obviously, you know, not winning the, the finals or anything, nothing at all or just, yeah. No, just another tour. Go to India, be, beat India. If, if we had won every game we played in India, that would not have made up for the World Cup, losing the World Cup in 1983. Yeah. So it was not a matter of us trying to prove a point. We knew we were good. That final of 1983, as I have said before, is the team that plays best on the day that wins a one-day game. And that final of 1983, India played the best. So we couldn't afford to be going to India now and say, we're going to try and make up for that final. Going to India, as usual, as we were would have done on any other tour. We're going to try and win every game and try and to be as dominant as we possibly could. But it wasn't a revenge tour, nothing like that. Right. Right, Mikey, thank you so very much for your time. It was absolute and absolutely an honor to uh, speak to you as always. Well, I, uh, uh, I missed out on the opportunity to get my copy signed by you, but I'm going to get hold of you hopefully sometime soon. And get don't, don't throw it away when we our parts cross, I'll sign it. Thank you so very much again. Absolute pleasure, Mikey. Thank you. No problem. My pleasure, Deep. Take care. <laughs>